So uh, because the topic is about Python and uh, data science, so essentially I would like to give a, a relatively high level uh, presentation now why we want to use Python in data science. And uh, so what, what is so unique about Python in data science? Okay. So before I uh, start this presentation, I would like to understand uh, like how many of you have some like program programming experience before? Okay, good. General programming? Yeah, general, any general programming. Like uh, in, even in Excel, you have the programming, right? So each cell, you have write a formula. Or this. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, so what, what kind of programming languages are you using before, or, like right now? Oh, jeez. Uh, right now, none. Oh, I see. Okay. I deal with BI applications. Ah, I see. Uh, long history in .NET languages. Ah, I see. C Sharp, C++, ah, I see. Uh, .NET. Um, I see. I've done some Python as it relates to Esri geomapping. Oh, okay. Python. okay. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Good. Thanks, Chris. So, uh, so the purpose of the talk will not be so low level, and uh, it's because uh, the purpose is just to introduce why Python is important and what you can expect in uh, data science for using Python. So essentially, uh, it's not meant to be complete and comprehensive. I will not like uh, go over every like uh, small tricks like uh, shortcuts. So it will be more in high level, but you will understand uh, what you need to know, and you, you can go ahead and uh, focus on what you need to learn. Okay, so, uh, so I will focus this presentation on the big picture, and so you will be able to know what you can do with Python, but you still need to maybe learn some libraries and get those uh, dirty work uh, yourself, and then finally you will be able to handle the different kind of projects. Okay. So, uh, and the purpose is, uh, one important purpose is uh, uh, to advertise our uh, MSDS program, which is a Master of Science in Data Science, okay. and uh, uh, which is a new degree, and we, so I'm from the Computer Science Department, but we are promoting data science quite uh, uh, intensively these days, because we have this new degree, and we have opened a lot of new classes in data science, and a couple of faculties uh, in data science, okay, and uh, so also we are looking for like uh, collaborations. Let's say with my research lab, if you if you think some of the stuff that can be useful to you guys, like in accounting, financing, or something, then you can uh, let me know. Maybe we can do some uh, collaboration or some research projects. Okay, so yeah, so just to give a brief introduction, what uh, like uh, in specific what I do in my research lab. Okay, so. Uh, I focus on two broad directions. One is, you know, scalable systems for uh, scalable systems algorithms uh, for big data analytics. Okay, so like, uh, like how many of you heard of like Hadoop? Yeah, so essentially, you know, that Hadoop is a distributed system where you have the file system, which is HDFS over multiple machines, and you're computing like those frameworks like Spark, Hadoop, uh, in a distributed manner when do the computation. And uh, I do a lot of this kind of distributed computing and the parallel computing. And uh, if you think a memory consumption is too high, you don't have so much memory in the machine, we develop algorithms or systems that can stream the data. So only a small buffer of data is in memory each time. Okay. And we also uh, study how to fully utilize the CPUs. If you look at Hadoop, it's really not for fully utilizing the CPU most of the time. It's just disk I.O. streaming all the data. Okay. And so uh, the other broad direction is about developing data science applications, uh, especially those folks on machine learning, which is quite hot these days. Okay, and uh, so here I will uh, list some of the applications that can be used, like social media analysis, finance data analysis, and uh, like medical data analysis, because UAB is uh, have a very strong medical school, so also analyze a lot of that kind of data. And uh, of course, this is uh, really in like a Data science, just to the point of view, maybe uh, it will be like graph data, which you have no the edge is connected. What's kind of the relationship? You run some graph analytic algorithm, graph mining algorithm, and the finance data maybe uh, you know the time series. Okay, and also like some data maybe have your spatial data, all those properties, how to better utilize them. Okay. So I would say that the first big category is called big data. Okay, which has been quite hot. Uh, like for the last decade, Google developed all those kind of frameworks. Okay, so and uh, these days, uh, I think the, this decade we really talk about uh, data science. Okay, so like you know all those deep learning stuff is coming and uh, kind of dominating these days. And so you, you might want to learn a little bit of what is deep learning, what kind of tools can help you in that aspect. Okay, so 
what is Python? Python is essentially a programming language. Okay, and uh, so what is the feature of the Python language? Okay, so there are several important features. One is uh, it's an interpreted language. Okay, this is important because uh, if you don't need to compile the language, it's just interpret your code and then run it. Okay, uh, it's slow, but uh, you can do that interactively. We will see why later. Okay, it's unlike if you write C, Java. Okay, you need to compile like C. You need to compile to the object file and Java. You need to, uh, compile to the dot class file, which will be much slower. Okay, and you cannot do that interactively. You debug and then you compile and then run again. Okay, that will be much slower from programming productivity side. Okay, and uh, Python is an object-oriented programming language where you can have the objects. Like you think about how objects operate uh, with each other. Okay, so this is very intuitive, and. Uh, it's a very high level, and you will see a lot of features uh, in this presentation. Like you don't need to define the variable; whenever you want to use it, you just use it. Okay, so this is very convenient. Okay, and there are a lot of built-in data structures, but this is actually the same for all languages. Okay, so but the Python will introduce what kind of data structures there are. You can easily use. Okay, we also call them collections. Okay, and so why now that we have so many languages, right? So I think the uh, dominant languages like uh, uh, C, C++, Java, and Python. Okay, but why Python is catching up and becoming dominating in some sense? Okay, so so uh, this is a comment from uh, Bruce, uh, which is from the C++ committee member, and uh, what he comment is life is short. You need Python. Okay, so because essentially what it means is that maybe you write the C code to do some task. It takes like one day, Python just uh, let's say ten minutes. Okay, so although it runs slower, but if you don't have that much data, maybe Python is much easier okay, for you. So here are the pros and cons of the three important languages. Uh, the, for example, if you consider C C++, this is really very low level to the hardware. If you look at high performance computing libraries, most of them are in C C++. Okay, so uh, ex execution speed is fast. Okay, Java is Kind of in the middle because it runs on Java virtual machine, okay, but still very fast. And Python really slow, okay. So execution speed is slow. But on the other side, if you want to do the programming, okay, C++ is very. You have a, a, a lot of pressure when you uh, do the coding because you need to care about memory management or delete some stuff, okay. And uh, Java, you don't worry about delete some stuff, but still you cannot do interactive. Uh, coding because you need to compile and see what's happening. Okay, Python is if you do some development, it's super fast. Okay, so this is really uh, so. For example, if you are not very like, feel very fun about C++ programming, right? Maybe you are not the, the, the those kind of programming guys. And Python kind of have a middle way for you. Like you, you don't need to dive so deep into this programming stuff. It's a little bit easier for you. Okay, and you can do a lot of projects more productively. Yeah. So, but the problem is that Python is execution speed is slow, right? So, what is, does that matter? So, what I want to say is that you can view Python as a very advanced shell. So, just a, like shell language in uh, Linux, okay, uh, in in Mac. Uh, if you consider Windows, it's like bash files, right? So, CD, OS, those. Okay, just just consider it like a shell, but it's not just a shell. It's a very advanced shell. Okay, it's slow. But no one care about if you write a shell language, a bash file. You don't care about what, whether it's slow or not, right? Because down there, it's running some C code. You're calling some program, OK? So that's the, the, the key thing why uh, how you can uh, run Python very high performance. So here is a, uh, uh, a Python, which is a, essentially a tool that can kind of compile your Python code to C and utilize it, so it interactive with uh, Python and the C code, and so the, you can achieve C, C code speed, which is the fastest speed, but you can still benefit from Python's user friendliness in programming. Okay, so you can look at if you, you are interested, you can go to this link. Okay. So you can see that this is the Python the compiled language that are compiled to C or C, plus, but actually, uh, it, it, you just need to consider about Python or a little bit more stuff about Python. And if you look at another very uh, important machine learning library in Python called uh, uh, Scikit-learn. So this sign is scientific computing. So it's not a sky, it's Scikit-learn. Yeah. <laughs> scientific computing kit. 
you know, tool, toolkit and uh, for machine learning, I think kind of, this is easy to remember. Okay, so you can see that there's, yeah, they, they have a lot of size and stuff. So, so what you're doing when, let's say you run a uh, machine learning model, let's say decision tree random forest, supported by machine, okay, uh, if you've heard of those, actually they're running C, for example. Okay, so it's very fast. It will be much faster than what you think, right? And uh, so another very important thing in Python is that you just learn the language, it's not useful at all, okay? You need to learn something, some libraries about it. Okay, one of the most important and basic one is the NumPy array, which is kind of like if you have learned the MATLAB or R, essentially it's the matrix stuff, okay? So matrix representation of data and uh, you have vectorized operation for that, okay? So for, for this, in Python, we use NumPy, right? But you can see that NumPy array oper operations are implemented in C, so it's very fast, okay? So actually, you are benefiting performance from C if you are calling NumPy operations, okay? So the speed is really not a problem, but there's one lesson that you need to learn. Try to avoid writing your own for loop. Python is very flexible, you can do everything, but your for loop may be 10 times slower, or even 100 times slower than NumPy arrays operation. Okay, try to think uh, in a vectorized manner. Okay, instead of just writing your own C loop, uh, for loop. Okay. And uh, so uh, another thing is that if you look at TensorFlow and the other major uh, software for deep learning these days, they all use Python as a front end because this is easy to play with. Okay, it's easy to think about because API is simple. But down there, they are running on C++ and CUDA which is a kind of C-based uh, library for GPU computing, okay? So you can see Python speed is not really an issue if you learn the libraries, right? And it could be much faster than writing your own C code because these are written by experts because they have the fastest speed, right? So, but now for interactive operating for numerical computing, there are other tools like R, right? And there are like uh, MATLAB, and uh, you know that it's also interactive. <coughs> you, you define variable, and then you can hold there, think a while, and then cont continue to operate on that, right? Python is kind of similar in this aspect. So it interpreted language. So what's so unique about Python, okay? So the first thing is that uh, it's really become popular by a tool called IPython Notebook, okay? Uh, a notebooks, actually, okay? So, so now it calls Jupyter Notebook, okay? So essentially now, uh, this tool can no, no, not only handle Python, but can handle, let's say, all inter interpreted languages, like uh, um, R, maybe it can also handle that in a similar manner, but it starts from Python, okay? And we will see what it is and why it's so important. And the, if you learn Python these days, unlike one decade ago, you really want to go with, let's say, Jupyter Notebook, okay? And uh, so what is so special about Jupyter Notebook? It's, a, it's essentially like an IDE for your programming, but in Python you don't really need that, so it's, it's interactive. You can directly interact in some space, okay? but uh, this is essentially a user interface for you to write and execute Python code in your own web browser. Okay, so uh, essentially you can uh, play with the code, execute and then change it if there are error and then add another piece of code, essentially, uh, essentially interactive. Programming. We will see it in the next few slides. Okay. So interactive, no compiling. Okay. So you don't need to compile, wait, and this is the code. What it looks like. Okay. So to start the Jupyter Notebook, I will I will demo this start, uh, shortly. Okay. So to start the Jupyter Notebook, what you do is just uh, type a command. If you after you install the Jupyter Notebook, okay, <coughs> just uh, where wherever you are, add the folder structure in your directory structure. In, uh, in your operating system, you just uh, type this command. It will create a server as an area. Then you can just, uh, uh, let's say, on a local machine, you can link to your server in the browser, and uh, those files will be visualized to you by the server. And you can just code and uh, play with it there. Okay, so here's the uh, screenshot of what it will be looking like. So essentially, once you start the Jupyter Notebook, okay, you just go to this link, Okay, it will show you the current folder where you started the Jupyter Notebook and what files are there. And you can operate on all files within this folder okay, and this directory, okay, maybe some directory, et cetera. Okay? So for this example, in this folder, we only have one file. So you can see this. This is a .ipython notebook. 
this is a shorthand notation for this kind of notebook file. Okay, so the notebook is not a, like a so it's this kind of electronic notebook. It's just a, a a kind of notebook, traditional notebook where you can write notes and then you can see what code runs. It's this kind of concept. Okay, and if you click through, you will open this file. Okay, and uh, when this file is open, you can essentially put cells into this interface. Okay, into this notebook. Okay, so a notebook actually composed of many cells. Okay, each cell can contain either Python code or some node for you, you yourself, for example. Okay, and uh, so the benefit of this is that uh, when you are playing with it, you actually remember the whole history of it, right? So, and your boss can see what you are doing and uh, track it just by playing with it. And other people, if you share with other people, they can see all you, what you are doing and uh, learn from this process. Okay, so, so this is really good. Okay. So, for example, here we have define a variable x equal to 1 plus 1, but x, you don't need to define it's an integer or something, you just use it, okay? And then you can print it. Okay. So after you print it, it will return you a number 2, okay? But yeah, just like uh, Excel, we need some short, uh, like uh, hot keys, like sh shortcuts, uh, to help you with the most common operations, right? You don't need to click this button, for example, to play it. Okay, so actually, if you in your, your like keyboard, you have shift and enter there, it will run the cell, okay? There are all other kind of operations like delete the cell or move the cell up and down here like this. Okay, so it's very convenient. But for running, you do if you ever remember one hotkey, just to remember this. Okay, shift enter, just run this. Okay, and uh, so for the global variable, like this is the global variable. It's not in a function or in a class. Right? So for this global variable, it will carry over throughout the session of this notebook. Okay, so just like in MATLAB. Right? Okay, so. Now you can continue to say y equal to 2 times x, because x is 2, y should be 4, right? So you can remember it. It's actually in the memory. And you can delete it by DEL operation. Okay, then it will be no longer there. And uh, so, frankly speaking, this is just uh, to help you do the dirty work, okay? So keep your code there and help you redirect your standard output to, to the cell so that you can see what's happening there, you can check the code. So it's helping you do the dirty work. Okay, so this thing itself is still just uh, all those tags in the code. Okay, so you need to save it after update. Otherwise, next time you open it, it will be the previous one. It's not the latest one. Okay, so this is important if you use it. Okay, yeah. So, uh, but you you want to look at this notebook. You have to create a server, Julia Malo for server to use it, right? Sometimes you don't want to do that. You don't just want to view it. You can save it as, let's say, HTML file. Then you can just use any browser, open it, and you can see the whole process. Okay, and what's happening there? If you save it up as HTML, does it write <coughs> code behind the scenes? If you did some simple addition and multiplication? No, oh, oh, this is just a for a snapshot where you, you have done something. Okay. Then you want to save this snapshot. There. Okay. So there's no code anymore. As so I said, it does the dirty work to run if you click the shift to enter, but then that, that's it. That's the word that you output, that's what's it, what you're coding. Okay. But you can view it without a creating a server. This is more common. Yeah, so uh, if you want to get started, you can take a screenshot of this. Okay, so, uh, so essentially what you need to do is to install Anaconda. Okay, Anaconda is a Python uh, a a package dependency handler, essentially, because Python, there are two versions of language these days, Python 2 and Python 3, and they are not backwards compatible, which means you write Python 2 code, their dependencies, their code is different from Python 3, Python 3 cannot recognize Python 2, Python 2 cannot recognize Python 3, right? So your libraries, kind of, there are two sets of libraries, right? So you don't want to have libraries all installed in your operating system, they conflict with each other. So what you do is you create those virtual machine, a virtual environment, and let's say I enter this environment, that's my Python 2 environment. The other one is my Python 3 environment. Okay. So when you need it, you enter the virtual environment, it will load the library for you. Okay. So this uh, you, you need to anaconda for that. Okay. And uh, so once you, you go there, that link, it will recognize a computer, whatever, uh, like Mac or Windows, it will give you the download file, you just install it. Okay, totally free. And then you can, uh, once it's installed, you have this command, you can create some, uh, let's say, some common environment okay, with a specific name there. Okay, you can say I want a Python 3. 
And once this is done, uh, essentially, it will install some, a bunch of Python software for you because it's a lot of dependencies. Like Jupyter Notebook will be in, automatically installed okay, like in this environment. Then when you want to use it, you just say source activate, you will enter this environment. And if you want to leave, just say source deactivate, it will essentially, uh, uh, this will load the libraries, it will unload the libraries. Okay. So yeah, if you want to get started, this is sufficient for you to get started. Okay. And, and all those are executed on the command line? Oh yeah, this is the command line, yeah. You don't have to. Yeah, yeah. This, this you need a command line. This you need a command line. Oh. Yeah, because you have not don't have the Jupyter notebook yet, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, is this you do need to have Jupyter. After that, you enter the environment, you create a Jupyter notebook. Okay, that's what. Okay, so yeah, here the Python uh, uh, the demo time for what is Jupyter notebook and uh, how the Python language is looking like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no? okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's working. Yeah. So essentially, I have this folder for Python demo. Okay. Uh, what I can do is I just want to create a, uh, you know, is it too small for you? Let me see what I can. I never did change the phone size. Let me see whether I can just use control plus. Yeah, that, that works. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Right, so yeah, so now I'm at this folder. Okay, this is the folder I will uh, essentially create a uh, server, Jupyter Notebook server at this folder. It will show all the files down, down there. Okay. So you just type, uh, of course, uh, here I don't need a virtual environment because I installed Jupyter Notebook in my operating system directly. Okay. And when you create it, after a while, it, it will activate this, uh, you know, this, uh, it will enter this folder, okay? And you can then use these notebook files. And uh, these are exactly those files I put here, okay? And uh, so, yeah, we'll let, let, let's see some basic type Python stuff. Because I, I, I think uh, we will not get too deep in there, but we will kind of have a very high mm -hmm. level review of that. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay. So in Python, uh, these cells you can write Python code. You can also write what? You can also write JavaScript code. Okay. Like uh, for example, if you play around with this, this is like a magic command. You can clear all of them by running this piece of code. And in here, you can add a cell, write whatever code you want, okay? And you can even run, let's say, I want to see what, what is in my local folder, I can run those command, okay? Like CD, a uh, CD you cannot, because this is a directory, but all other commands, you can, you can do that, okay? Yeah. So, but you need a commission mark before that, okay? You can delete it, okay, so, so here is an example, let me see whether I can make it larger, yeah. So in Python, you don't need to define the variable before using it. Okay, for example, I want to x which is 3, I just define, okay? And then you can print the value of 3, and you can see what type it is. It will automatically derive its type as in, okay? So this is very convenient, okay? And then this value will be carried over, so x plus 1 will be 4, right? And uh, times 2 will be 8, right? Okay, so essentially, you just uh, do whatever you want, and uh, so if you want to delete it, just uh, say I want to delete the variable. It will be deleted. Okay. Can you define the variable if you want to? No, nope. actually, <laughs> uh, at least I never did that. I never did that. It's all like uh, you just leave it to Python. Okay. And this is even so, if you have a you know it's an object-oriented programming, you have a class. Okay. This class can uh, have like a members, member variables, and a member functions. And uh, you know here you don't need like the self is this object self. Okay. Self name equal to this input name, okay? And here you don't even need to say I have a variable called name, okay? It automatically have a name there when you, you run this code, okay? So, for example, if I create an object and uh, using this class and I put flat there, okay? And uh, by default, the log will be false, so it will go to uh, this branch, okay? And uh, it will print self name, but Self name is not defined before, right? There's no member defined here for self name. 
But because when you construct it, this is the constructor. Okay, this constructor will do this, take this and assign to a variable inside here. So it, it will take it. Okay, so what you will see is like, uh, hello, Fred, and if you log equal to true, it will be hello, Fred. Okay, but in Python, you, you always need to put your object also here. It's, not, it's kind of different from other languages. Okay, so the thing is that you don't need to define a variable. Okay, it's very convenient. Whenever you think you want to use it, just use it. Okay, and uh, not, not even type derivations of those things. Okay, and uh, just like any other language, like in C, we have STL libraries. Okay, like Vector, Java, ReList, and the hash map, those things. Okay, so Python has something similar. Okay. So Python has a list, okay. So a list is essentially an, a vector of items, but you can add to the back of the uh, list with very efficient cost, almost a constant cost. So what end of food it's doing is when you have the method capacity, it will double the space, and so that you can continue with very low cost. So only adds those boundaries is very costly, and the average cost actually constant, okay. So, so this is like a uh, vector in C and uh, C++ and uh, like a uh, array list in Java. Okay, and so the thing that is different is that in this kind of array, this kind of list, you can put different types of data there, right? You can put one, you can put two as a string. Okay, and you can say this is location zero, this is location one, so it will have two. Okay, this is location through two, right? But you can go from the back. Okay, this minus one will be the last location. Okay. Yeah, if you try to minus two, for example, it will be two, right? So, 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 come from the back. Okay. Yeah. So, and you can also append an element. As I said, the li list operation append is very efficient. Okay. Inserting in the middle is not efficient. It will move things wrong. Okay. But you can pop up a push, it's very efficient. Okay. Then you can pop out an element from the back. Well, we put two x, and uh, this list will get rid of that. Okay, some popular operations. Okay, and uh, you can then once you get the list, you want to get uh, some particular items in the middle of it, right? So what you can do is let's say you can define. So in Python three, uh, range essentially is the item. Like say, if you want to range five, it will return you an iterator that will iterate zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, so this is the logic there. So it will have a range zero to five. Five is exclusive, zero is inclusive. Okay, so zero to four. Okay, and uh, if you get the, these items, it will be two, two to four, right? But four is exclusive, two is inclusive. Okay, so it will be two and three. The second is third. Okay, actually, the third is the fourth because it starts from zero. So let's take a look at this. So if you want to expand this range object, it will be the actual object. Let's see what, what we'll print. Okay, so it will be. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 5 is inclusive. Okay? But you add this, it will expand it. Okay? Then you can get 2 and 4. What will be the, the object there? So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? But 4 is inclusive. It will get 2 and 3. Okay? And if you get 2 to the end, it will essentially get everything to the end. Okay? And you get uh, everything before it. Right? Because this, is, this, is, this side is exclusive. So it will be 0 and 1. Okay, these two elements, right? So, and this you can get the whole row. And the minus one essentially means I will go to the last element, right? But this is exclusive, so we'll get rid of the last element. Okay. So it you will not have the last one. Okay, and uh, let me see. Yeah, and you can even change the numbers there. Okay, let's say I have a range of them. I have the third and fourth element, I want to change eight, nine. Essentially, zero, one, two, three. Two, three, one, two, three, eight, nine. You can do that. And it, you print it, it will be 8 now. Okay. And you can loop those elements. It's very simple. Just uh, you have a collection, like a list, and the four, everything in there, you can print it, and it will print the element. And you can also, uh, let's say you want to index. You can use a numerator operator. It will give you the index. Sometimes you need the index to do something. Okay. Let's say the index for both arrays, which are kind of referring to the same thing. You need to get the location. What was your warning about loops earlier? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it would be slow. If you have library, you can call. Mm -hmm. You use that. But for here, we just print. We have to use a loop. Okay. Some some tasks we have to use loop. But if you can avoid, try to avoid. Mm -hmm. Use some library. Okay. So uh, and we also have list compression. Okay. You can write a loop. Let's say for every element, I want to create a new array, a new list, right? And each one is like square, right? 
But you can write it simply like this. Everything to the square before every element to the n. Okay. Then it will return you this. Okay. Every number squared. And you can even add a condition. Let's say I only want to have even number squared. I don't want all the number squared. Okay. So this will also work. Right. Okay. And uh, we can also have dictionary. Dictionary like a uh, map if you write C or Java. Okay. So you have a key value pairs. It's actually. Uh, if you want a specific version, you will implement in binary search tree of the log n cost. Okay. If you want to even faster but use more memory, you can use hash map. Uh, so essentially, this is kind of like hash map. So you, what you do is you say key is cat, value is cute, right? Dog is key, fur is the value. Okay. Then I look at the dictionary, give the key, what is the value? Right? It's cute. Okay. And uh, the key is really in dictionary, so it's true. Okay. In Python, the true false actually is the upper, uppercase, capital letter for, for true false. Okay. And uh, then you can say, I want to insert a new element there. Uh, fish is wet, right? So if you do that, it will be something like this. Okay. And you can delete it. Okay. So always remember, delete is the operator to the object. You can delete the fish entry. And then if you get it, you, you, you will say, if it's not there, you will show me this screen. Okay. So if you run it, it will be not available. And your dictionary will only come to that because fish are deleted. Okay. And there are also stats. Stats and dictionaries are the same thing, but uh, dictionary has a key and a value, right? Stat is essentially just have the key, you don't have the value. You're not looking up something, you are seeing whether your key is in this range. Okay, so uh, essentially, if you have a stat of cat and dog, you will ask whether fish in the, in the stat it will be false. Right, so yeah, let me see. Uh, I probably need to skip a couple of this. So also there's the tuple. Tuple essentially is like a list, but it's it's kind of uh, fixed size. Okay, so it, it, if you define tuple with parentheses, uh, it will be a tuple object, and uh, you can see that you can define uh, empty tuple. Okay, and you can define a single term, which is only one element in tuple. Okay. But that, in that case, we will need a comma there because otherwise it could be you, you can there's ambiguous you can it can mean something else right okay so it may not be the tuple okay so you need this okay. otherwise it could be something else and uh, so there are also functions and in functions uh, Python is unique in that you can return anything you don't need to define the return value okay for example if you get a number if it's positive you can return a tuple. Right, positive one, and if it's negative, you just return a string. If it's zero, you return zero a number. Okay, and uh, you can really do that. For example, in this list, we we, we just give different input minus one zero one. It will return you different kind of return values. Okay, this is flexibility. Okay, and uh, yeah, so you can also have this kind of optional arguments. So if you don't pass in it, it will use a default argument. Okay, otherwise it will use a True argument, uh, the, 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 the argument you give. Okay, in that case, you don't need to list the off variables like in this order. You can just look at like key value pairs. Okay, this is convenient because in many machine learning libraries, these default objects are not good enough. You just want to choose some of them. Let's say two of them. There are ten, for example. Then you probably just say of oh, these two parameters, I want to change. Okay, that's it. And so learning Python is not sufficient. You also need a library on top of Python, and every machine learning library on top is actually based on NumPy. Okay, NumPy is just like, uh, you know, in MATLAB, the, the matrix, the basic concept. But uh, NumPy is different in that it's an array, it's not a matrix. And you can think about matrix as a two-dimensional array. Okay, so we can have three-dimensional array or even larger. Okay, it's a tensor, essentially. Okay, so you can see that deep learning, we need a tensor flow, those things, so go beyond two dimensions. Sometimes three or four is very common. Okay, so, but this is just notational issues. Uh, down there, actually, is you just need a two dimension in the region. There's channels, RGB, and the different filters. But, but essentially, this using NumPy array, it's more convenient to operate on this. Okay, so let's see how to create an array. Let's say you have a list. You put in this function, NumPy array, it will create an array for you. And uh, it will print. Let me see. Let's see. Yeah, I, I didn't run this. Okay, you need to import the library. And you say NumPy, now I rename it to NP. Okay. And once you import the library, you run it, it will run. Okay, so this is a convenient part with 
Jupyter Notebook because you, you, you can see the error and you fix it. Immediately, you don't compile and the, the others can see. Okay. So you can see this will be an n-dimensional array. And the shape is really three elements, right? One dimensional, where well, there are three elements in the first dimension. Okay. So they are one to three. Okay. You can use this to accept them. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I would like to skip something because, yeah, so let's look at something more interesting here. So uh, you, you can also define a rec2 array and uh, operate, uh, get the element by the index. Okay, let's say the last one is one zero, which means one is the second row, zero is the first column, four will be written. Okay, so you can do all those things just like in MATLAB. And so with this B there, this is a B array, one, two, three, four, five, six, two rows, okay? You can do a lot of vectorized operation. Just call NumPy array. It's much faster than writing your own for loop. Okay. For example, if you want to sum all the elements there, what you will do is you run this NumPy dot sum. It will return you the sum. Okay. And uh, if you don't want just to return the sum, what you want to is actually sum each row. Okay. So what you will get is one two three get you six four five. Uh, these will give you fifteen. Right. You can do that also, but you need to say uh, along which direction I want to do that. Okay, axis equal to one is actually summing by rows because it returns you a column. So the axis equal to one is a column one. Okay, so this is kind of confusing. Some people may put it reward zero and make the mistake. So you just consider the NumPy array is n-dimensional array. It's not the matrix. Okay, so you can understand this, right? And uh, this is 615. But this will typically return you the, the list. Okay, so it's just the array. Okay, one-dimensional array. And uh, actually what I want is, uh, for example, two-dimensional array, right? So I want a column vector because uh, if you consider each row is a sum, this will be six, this will be 15, right? So uh, if I want a column vector, I need to tell it explicitly, I want to keep the dimensions, okay? And then it will return you the six to 15, okay? And because two-dimensional array is a matrix, you can take the transpose, it will be the row vector, still two-dimensional, okay? One-dimensional array, it will be itself, okay? So essentially, if you look at MATLAB, MATLAB will just provide you a two-dimensional array. Okay, uh, this is a, an average-dimensional array. Okay. This is the difference, okay. and you can create uh, like a bunch of zeros or random numbers. They are very convenient. And uh, the important thing I want to talk about is array indexing. Uh, essentially, let's say you can put a list here, three rows, and you put each this array, and let's see what it will be looking like. Okay, so the list is this. After you create the array, it will be this array. And the important thing is that you can get the, get the elements there. Okay, for example, you can get, uh, let's say, all the way to 2. So this will be 0, 1, because 2 is exclusive. Okay, so this means the rows, I want to get the first two rows, 0, 1, 2, right, 0, 1. Okay, and if you look at the column, I want 1, 3, but this is 0, this is 1, 2, 3, but 3 is exclusive, so I will get this. Okay, I will get this. Okay, this is a sub-matrix in some sense. Okay. Right, so this part is it. Okay, you just uh, give the brain. Okay, and uh, yeah, so, but when you get it into a array B, they link actually to the same object. This is like in Java, okay? It's everything in the pointer, but it's not explicitly I'm linking to the same object, okay? So if you change the elements in B, like here, like this element, let's say two, if I change it to some number, this element will also change. Together, okay. So this is a shallow copy in Python. So essentially, if let's say I want to change this element to two, okay, uh, to seventy-seven, then after change A's value is seventy-seven. Although I'm changing B, okay. So this is very uh, what you probably want to know. So if you print A, this value will be changed to seventy-seven, even though you're changing B seven. Okay. But of course you can do deep copy. So if you want to do deep copy, you do this. Okay. You can rerun the code also because it's still a notebook. Okay. So you re recreate the array using the list. Okay. Then we, we create this subarray. But now it's a deep copy. Okay. Every element is not pointing to the same element. Okay. Okay. So now I change to seventy-seven, but A's element do not touch. Okay. Because I'm copying to a new space. Okay. So if you look at A, it will still be. Two. Okay, so something like this. Uh, let me see. Yeah, there are different ways to get the array indexing, and the one particular thing you need to notice is that 
uh, if you use, let's say, a range or this to define what you want, okay, it's considered a set, so the dimensionality will not be reduced, so it will return you a two-dimensional array. Okay. But if you just say, I want the first row, uh, this is the second row, actually, start point, right? it will actually reduce the dimension that is a CSF1. Okay. Okay, so this is the minor details. Okay. And uh, you can actually get elements from the array. For example, if I have a NumPy array, one, two, three, four, I want to gather the two elements at particular locations. Right? So this is 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, and 1. I should return 2 and 4. Okay. And uh, this can also go, go beyond the one dimensional. Okay. I, I will not go into detail for this. And another thing very interesting the Boolean array indexing. So array indexing is a very convenient thing. Uh, it can replace a SQL language if you, you just load data into like files and operate here. It will be much faster actually than SQL. Language. For example, let's say we have this array and we print it. And then I can see that this array larger than two. This is essentially saying every element, whether it's larger than two or not, is yes, true, if not false. Okay, for example, uh, after get this, I print the boot index, it would be, oh, this is smaller than two, right? It's false. It's not larger than two, false. The other are true. Okay? And uh, given that, Booleans array, you can further go back to this uh, array and uh, just to pick all those elements that are true, essentially it's three, four, five, six, right? And uh, return you as a one-dimensional one list. Okay. So you can uh, combine them into one, one statement. This is like a select operation, right? Select all elements, which is this very convenient. Okay. And we also have broadcast, essentially if you have arrays like this. So there are four rows, one, two, three, Five, six, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and you can add one. Add one essentially it will know that it's add one to every element in the array. Okay, so you will get two, three, four instead of one, two, three. Every element can be five. So this is called broadcasting, and will broadcast to your shape. There are some rules I will not get into details unless you really want to learn this stuff. Okay, so uh, but you can also add a row array, a row vector. Okay, in that case, it will broadcast all the row vectors to all those four rows. Okay. So essentially, this will be added one, this will be added one, this, but this will be zero. Similarly, this will, these two will be added one. Okay? So let's say this row it will be 5, 5, 7, 7, right? Okay. So it will be looking like this, 5, 5, 7. Okay? It will broadcast uh, this column to every one, uh, a row to every row, and add it to it. So you don't need to write too many code for that. Okay. Oh, it's the name. Oh, uh, you see. Yeah. It goes down. Oh, okay. It's like on automatic, like, sleep mode or So something. what, what should I do? The mm -mm. Just hold on a second. Let me see. Yeah. Yes. I have to shut it down. Start. You're fine. I just got to oh, okay. shut it down. Okay. Sure. Yeah. It's like an on, on an automatic timer. It always happens. Oh, I see. So is it complex to fix or? <laughs> Hold on. You don't want the computer. You got HDMI in there? What? Yours is uh, HDMI, yeah. Okay. Right, there we go. Okay. Okay. I'm scared to hit the power button. Probably has to cool down. No, it's um, it's on a, it's on a timer, like, because we don't have meetings in here all day, and then people will forget to turn it off, so they set an automatic timer and just shut it down at like seven o'clock. Yeah, maybe I have a cup of tea. Oh yeah, absolutely. Two seven. Chris. Be safe, right? <laughs> oh, that's good. It's going back. Oh yeah, okay. All right, cool. So now that's turning on and I turned this oh, I see. off. That's my bad. I turned it off because I didn't think it was turning off. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. We are back. So.
Yeah, there are so many minor details about Python language, so I, I don't want to go too deep into there. So what have we see so far is IPython, uh, Jupyter Notebook, okay, always call it IPython Notebook. You know, it's interactive operation, it's very convenient, right? Just write a piece of code, run it, and see what's the output, okay? And uh, so it's way faster than writing a C code. Okay, you, you immediately see what's the bug, and uh, ch like change your code a little bit, and we run it, okay? And uh, we see what the Python language is like, right? So you have those convenient construct for you. And uh, on top, you know the very important library NumPy, which is essentially the replacement of like a matrixing, you know, MATLAB or R, right? So on top of that, you can do all kind of machine learning, those things, okay? Yeah, so now let's think about Python and data science, okay? So, yeah, so, so the first reason is really, uh, let me see, I, I kind of forget the reason. Oh, the first reason is interactive, okay? But if you think about Python is interactive, okay, MATLAB is also interactive, right? You create them, open the MATLAB or R and then write the code. You can really see what's happening. It remembers the variables, okay? So why is Python so popular these days, okay? So the second reason, which is very important, is there are libraries, okay? There are very good libraries. And uh, uh, these days, like, uh, we apply for NSF funding, just term called convergence, okay, so if everyone converts to some language or some solution, you've got a lot of results, it's a lot of libraries you can call, and uh, uh, because so, so many people competing with each other, you will get the best library, and not something that people randomly design, okay. So, uh, so essentially in Python, uh, besides NumPy, we have scikit-learn, or, or other kind of scikit libraries, okay, scikit-learn is mainly for machine learning, and uh, you have visualization, I know that, the, uh, I heard that some of you use uh, Tableau and uh, also like, uh, uh, you know, D3, all those things, right? But, but Matlab plot is like, uh, in Matlab you have plot, right? So it's kind of similar to that, okay? So you can plot some figures, okay? And uh, there's pandas, pandas will uh, go through it shortly. So this is for your data pre-processing, and previously you may do all those things in Excel, okay? Now you can have more flexibility, if you know a little bit with the uh, panda functions, okay? You can do whatever you want, right? So Let's take a look at it. So these are for like data pre-processing, machine learning, okay, numerical computing. And uh, then if you go to deep learning, uh, so you have TensorFlow, PyTorch, all those libraries are in Python, okay. And uh, as we mentioned, those are actually in C, but uh, but there's Python API you can call, okay, just like the shell, okay. And uh, you, if you want to analyze the language, like the, for example, you want to see what news there are and what's the trend, and, to the stock market, you can use NLP, natural language processing, and there are like an NLTK library and like a uh, Jensen library, so they are both for natural language processing, okay. And uh, they all implement the best, uh, the most stable, the, the classical algorithms there for machine learning, data analytics, and uh, you just call them. It's gonna be better than maybe writing your own piece of code. And it runs as fast as C code because it's actually down there, probably it's implemented C. Right. So, yeah, so the main reason why Python wins over, let's say, R is really, it's a converged data science solution. Everyone is going back to Python as the first thing you, you want to try. Like Apache Spark, you support Python, even though it's in Scala, okay? If you look at uh, TensorFlow, maybe it's support R, I'm not sure, but Python is the first, uh, like, the native language you want to use for, if you just want to build up, up there, okay? So, it's everyone is investing in Python, this is very important. Okay, and you do have all those very good libraries. You just call it instead of writing your own for like one month, you call it in one minute, okay, or something okay. like that. So let's have a demo of pandas. Okay, just, I mentioned pandas is like uh, you have some construct to pre-process the data, kind of like Excel, but can replace Excel. Okay, so and uh, let's look at a particular example. Well, actually, I have a, a collaborator in UAB uh, who works on hypertension. Okay, so it says patient data, uh, so it has different attributes. So uh, let's take a look. So uh, essentially, th that data kind of noise, okay, no noisy. So we need to clean the data first. If you do that in some other tools or you manually look, check at it, it will take forever, okay. Uh, we want to show how you can use Panda, clean the data immediately, uh, get you the, the result you want, so clean the data you want, okay. So this is very important. How many records? Uh, it's not too many, but it's noisy. I want, just want to show the how, uh, you know, how uh, to 
play with the data for data cleaning. But, but scalability is not an issue if the down there the library in C, so no worry. It scales well, like I tried a second learn machine learning library on 3 GB of data. It runs for within one minute, you can build a machine learning model. OK, so this is very scalable. It's essentially running in C in something. Okay. It's even faster than maybe you heard of Weka, another kind of machine learning library in C. OK, so people has all switched to uh, second learn for machine learning these days. Unless you develop your own model, okay. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look. So this is data cleansing. So what I get is essentially, uh, so a professor from UAB, I exported their hypertension data uh, to me, and uh, this is kind of crazy. It's overwhelming, you know, all those attributes there and. Uh, uh, there are over 1,000 columns, okay, and uh, all kinds of patient uh, so those measurements, all those data, okay. So what even a big headache is that so the data is not clean at all, okay. There's a lot of noise. Let's take a look. So essentially, this is in CSV file. So we will load that CSV. CSV you can read in uh, Eclipse, but essentially it's just a comma separated rows, okay. So attributes are separated by column. You can open it using, let's say, you a document file, let's see. Oh, sorry, I kind of pull it out. Yeah, you can open it. It's essentially a bunch of rows and with commas because there's 1,000, so one row is so long, you, you merely see the row number there. Okay. So. Okay, so. All you need to do uh, is to include pandas library and uh, use a short name called pd, right? And then you call it read CSV, the whole file will be loaded, okay? So it's just a 200 rows, but 1,000 columns. Okay, so we are not looking at the whole data set. We are just looking at 10 of them. If you look at the whole data set, uh, it will be 200 of them, okay? Sorry. 200 of them, okay? But there are so many columns, right? And if you look at the columns, actually there are four of noise. And for demonstration purpose, I will extract only uh, four of them. Okay. So if you think this is annoying, uh, you, you can use this mode. If you want to see it really not in this embedded form, you click this button. It will all, uh, let me see. It will show essentially like everything here, okay? But if sometimes we don't want it, we can click this button here again, it will be within this frame. Okay, so this is very common. Okay, so yeah, so what we do, so we, we just use panda load data, right? So so this is just like NumPy, they are NumPy compatible. Okay, so what you can do is say, okay, I want these columns, using these column, uh, let me see. Yes, this is sometimes too many data to see, okay. Use these headers, we can extract some columns. Okay, let's say we want uh, these particular columns we want, okay. And you can say, I want these columns, I put it here. It will extract those columns, very convenient, okay. And this is a mini database we will play with for this presentation, okay. And so you can see that these columns kind of most are numbers, right? This is like a missing number, not a number, okay. In Python, it would be not a number. These are the strings, okay. Yeah, this is still noise, and if you want to do machine learning or analytics, what can you do, right? So let's first see pandas, what other function it can do. For example, you want to add another column, okay? You want to add another column, whose so number is equal to like this age divided by 10, okay? So you can easily do that. You just say, I want another column called age by 10, and equal to this column divided by 10, okay? And then you can get, get that column, okay? Right, so yeah, it's here, okay? The last column. This is 40, this is 4, this is 25, this is 2.5, okay? This is super convenient, okay? And if you want to drop a particular column, let's say I want to drop the original col column age, you just say, I want to drop, get the column, then it's dropped, okay? I want to have this, yeah? So you said that they're noisy, so what if you have a character, a bar chart, in place of, in that, uh, column that should be numerical, and you're trying to do a calculation, how does it react? Okay, so it will essentially say, uh, I, I will go, go to that very soon. Okay, so let's go on. 
So here's a missing data. Okay, not a number. It's a missing data. If you find empty string, it will be not a number. And we can count the missing data. This length will essentially return the data set size like two hundred something. And for each column, it will return vector. Okay, uh, how many are not a number? Okay, so so this will return column. So a number minus uh, vector, it will expand to vector I mean minus. So it will return you how many missing data there are. Because this is the data for each column that are not missing. This is total number of data. Okay. So if you run this, you will see for these columns, we have do have a bunch of missing data here. Okay. And now it goes to the data cleaning part, which I, I kind of like answering your question. Okay. Yeah. So, so you can call this data frame uh, dot d types. It will return you what type you see. Okay. <coughs> you can see only age is a, 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 a you know real number, right? All the others are objects, which means it kind of mixed the types. Okay. Uh, some are numbers, some are strings. Okay. So, so why? Because if you look back, okay, most of them are numbers, right? Only this this one is strings. The others should be numbers, right? So this is really confusing. So uh, let's see why. So essentially, what you can do is say, I wanted this column. It should be numbers, but now it's object, right? It's not numbers. I want to convert it to numbers. Okay. If there's an error, that's raise it. Okay. So let's run it. Okay. When, when you're when yeah. it's trying to figure out which data type each column is, yeah. is it looking at every single record? Was it looking at the top 100 or? It looks at how, all the record for the column. Oh. And if it's one of them not number, it will say it's not okay. number column. Okay. And uh, then let's take a look. It says that uh, there's a value, this number that is not a number at position 55. Okay, so you just see what's happening in position 55. We print the 50 to 60. Oh, there's maybe a typo some, somewhere. It should be one dot, but there are two dots. It's no longer a number, right? So we can do, okay, I fix this number into two, 22 plus 3, and then reconstruct it to the column. Actually, I, I can do that. Okay, so this time there's no error. You may have more rows, and you, you do this repeat again and again. Okay, and then you just run it. Sorry, where's the mouse? So here, essentially, what you have is okay. I fix this. I try to mark again, right? Assign to this column, and I see what type there are. Okay, and now yes, this is fixed. Okay, this is now a floating point number. Okay, and now we can look at another column. This should also be a number. Why it's not a number, right? So you can run this. It report an error. When it want to convert this value to the number, okay, it cannot do that, right? So let's see, so this is at position 98, so I can report a range which contains that, okay? And let's see what's happening there. Okay, this number is wrong, okay? It should be maybe, I think, dot 03, okay? That says maybe a doctor has a typo there, okay? So you know, when they input the data into the database, okay? So yeah, you fix it to this value, and then they're all fixed. For the last one, actually, it's it should be string, okay? It should be string, because because these are the uh, like medicine like drug number names. Okay, so in that case, uh, let's take a look at. So so you want to see how many possible values there are, right? So what you can do is let me see where are we. So for that particular column, you can call value count, value counts. You count each unique value and how many times it appears in that column. Okay, for example, you count this. Okay, this medicine appears one hundred twenty-one times. Okay. Some appear the ones, it's kind of like this. This is like a histogram statistic for, for the column. Okay. Now what we can do is let's say we, we see this CH, this is one 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 drug, right? So this HC and this this HC, right? So this is another kind of drug. So I can just uh, go one by one, say if this is CH, I assign to one, if it's C, I replace the value to two, right? So then we count them into two numbers, okay? And then we can do machine learning models for them. Either. Because it, it, you can see there could be typos, there could be different kind of names. Uh, right? this, this is T, this is missing T, human error, or something. Okay. So you can clean data easily. Okay. And finally, if you want to save your data to CSV file, just call this, save. Okay. And then you can go back to your CSV file. Okay. And so you can combine your Excel and also, <coughs> uh, you know, Pandas will be very convenient. Okay. And there are a lot of libraries there you can try out. I'm just uh, illustrating one thing. This is called a data frame. Okay. <clears throat> this is 
this is Panda data frame, and there are also like other types you can try out, <laughs> like series. Yeah. <coughs> so from the CF defines, it, it showed the 119 columns. Yeah. So if I don't know the, I mean, if I'm looking for a column. Yeah. How would I do that here? I mean, I okay, so, so there are different kind of tools to do that. For example, uh, let's say this is a data set, right? You can call it data set dot columns. It will show you the set of columns. Yeah, now, now I chunk it into four. Okay, so, so there are only four columns. Okay, if you load it again, it will be 1,000 columns. Uh, we, we can do that here. So this is the Convenient about Python. You load, reload it again, this will be the whole data set. You try this, it will be all the columns. But you, you don't want to show all of them because they're. No, no, not all of them. If I'm curious to see, say, column that may be dealing with um, particular organ or something like that, I mean. Oh, you need uh, some domain knowledge in that case. Yeah, you need to talk to the doctor or any collaborator and see what are probably relevant to you, and you do something like select languages like what we just see. The filters are existing out, right? So whether they are string values or they are kind of numerical, and the narrow down and the pinpoint that. Column. So what I mean is something like um, yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I say I just uh, I just looked at the file, perused it, and yeah. I'm working on something, and then I remember that oh, by the way, I know there's a column that has I don't know the exact name of the column, okay, but I want to start typing what I think the name is. Okay, I needed to list everything that's almost like your intelligence. In okay, so so you can do something like this. For example, uh, you can iterate through the cells. Okay, and in Python you can say, let's say you you forget or, uh, so you can do this. For example, you have a string A B C, right? You remember A, A B is a substring of that, right? Mm -hmm. You can run it; it will return true. Okay, and if it's A B D, then it's false. Okay, so you can there are constructs for easily write code. You can do that. Okay. But show us every column that has the word plasma in it. What? Every column that has the word plasma. I think then may, 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 may not have such a column. Here. So uh, we, we can do this. For example, uh, the expression, is that what you yeah. Uh, let, let's do this. For example, you have this column, which is this ma medicine, right? Okay. Okay, so we can make a string. Okay. And uh, so uh, then we will get the column. Okay, in that column we want to get all those uh, all those that contain, let's say, twelve point five mg. Okay, right. So you can say, okay, twelve five mg is in uh, in that. Let me see how to say that. Oh, you can use apply actually. Let me see. You, you can define function and apply. It. Okay, so uh, for here, I maybe I just uh, iterate through it. This is very simple. So you just then uh, uh, convert it into a list. Oops. Oh, this should be parentheses. It, it's pain to run new code here. <laughs> It's kind of not presentation friendly, okay. And then you can see, uh, okay, we, we can do it in NumPy array. Let's see, we, we define this array as A, okay. Then we want to see, uh, we, we can return this, you know, uh, use this comprehension, okay. We can return all those x values for all those values inside this array. If, let's say, this, let's say this. 200, this mg, okay. Oh, we need a string. It's in a, uh, in x, right? Okay, we can do that. Then it will fit all those, those things. So essentially, we're true, true, false, 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 okay? Right. Let's see. Oh, I should import numpy. Okay, we have to use numpy here. Float is not editable. Okay, so some some are there are actually missing values. It will treat it as not a number. It will be float. So we can 
we can add another condition. Let's say x is not equal to uh, numpy dot not a number and okay so this should fix this problem yeah it's sometimes a pain to <laughs> record here yeah let me see let me try another way so just to convert it into string this may solve the problem okay okay yeah that solves the problem okay right. so because there's some missing missing values here it will refer to it as uh, not a number which will be a number okay so you can see everything is uh, yeah, so you can select those rows and X for the explorers. So there are all kinds of tools, but uh, you need to play with it. So okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I don't want to write code in the on in right now. It, it's a uh, not a good experience you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, there's something that is put offline. Something is for presentation, right? so, but we can do something. Yeah, this could be some. A bit uh, complicated. So, yeah. So then we can look at second learn. It is for machine learning. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, how it works. So essentially, second learn will read your NumPy arrays, but your values should be numbers. Okay. If it's not a number, you need to process it into numbers and run it. Okay. Let's take a look at. I think we will look at two, two Jovendo book files. Okay. So. Let's first look at this uh, random forest. So, how many of you know random forest? Okay, so essentially it's a decision tree. How many of you know decision tree? But uh, you, you essentially randomly sample the rows and columns, and so that you, you build those decision trees. And each is like a weaker version of decision tree, okay? And then you do majority vote on all of them. Okay, this is beneficial because some columns may be noisy and then missing data and then human error. And uh, you, you are sampling, you may, most of the models may drop that column, right? So it's not included there. Then the majority vote, you can cancel out the noise. Okay, usually it will return a better result than uh, decision tree. Okay, so this is called random forest. The forest is just many trees, right? So, okay, so essentially you, we will see a regressive problem. So in machine learning, uh, we have supervised learning, which means human will get the label, and you see whether you can predict those labels given your data features, okay? And there are two kinds of supervised learning problems. One is classification, where you will predict whether, let's say, an image is a cat or dog. Okay, well, there's also a regression problem. So you're, you predict a continuous value. What's the temperature now? Okay, given those features. Okay, so this is a continuous value. While classification is a categorical value you want to uh, predict. Okay, so this is different. We will look at the regression here mainly. Okay, so you will have to use uh, uh, Scalar's uh, random forest regressor. Uh, so we will use this data set. Essentially, it's actually right here. Uh, where is it? Yeah, it's here. This is CSV file. Essentially, you have like a, this is kind of seafood animal. Okay, so so this is uh, male, female, right? We want to predict according to the other other features. Okay, okay. and uh, so so what we want to do is essentially I look at those features. I predict whether it's male, female, and this is called infant. Okay. It's, uh, like a kid, uh, we don't know the, whether it's male or female yet. Okay, so uh, let's look at this code. So what you do is, again, you need to go back to pandas and uh, load this file. Okay, but in that file we don't have headers, right? So we need to specify what are the columns. It's usually in the data schema, in some other readme file. Okay, we we load them and uh, the default value is not an empty string. You need to say what is the default value. Okay, the missing value. It will be a question mark in the data set actually. So we will need to specify it. what is a not, not available number, okay. And uh, you can load it, okay. This will be loaded value, right. So we are just looking at the first 10 of them, okay. And then we can look at the sex column, which essentially is the label we want to predict. Oh, this is a classification problem, though. Let me see. Yeah, I think that this is not regressive. This is classification because we have those. Let me see whether, okay, sorry, I think, uh, yeah, so this is a regression problem. These sex is also another kind of feature, okay? And we want to create the ring, okay? You know, the more rings you have, the, the more expensive the uh, animal will get in the market. So we want to create the ring. These are continuous values, so it's still a regression problem, okay? So 
you want to see the like the diameter, how large it is, the weight, etc. You want to predict whether and the male female want to put how many rings it will have. Okay, so essentially one particular feature is not numerical, which is this categorical feature, and uh, it's not good if you encode them as one, two, three because they have no order relationship, right? Male is maybe not larger than female, and infant is not smaller than male. Right? It's just a different new features, right? So uh, the first thing you want to do is convert into uh, one-hop encoding, which essentially uh, we'll see that soon. Okay, so so uh, what you can do is you do this: get dummy. Okay, let's run. Get dummy essentially says that, that okay, I get rid of this column, but I create three new columns. Whether you are uh, female, infant, or male, right? And zero one. So this is kind of features, right? It's whether it's male, female, not whether it's male, not. If this matters, it will be in a decent tree, right? So this really makes sense, okay? So you can either do uh, encoding using get dummies, okay? After that, let's see. After that, you can switch the column. Essentially, now after doing that, your ring actually in here, right? You want to move to each um, a particular place so that. Uh, you can put pull all the other features together. Okay, so you can essentially get the columns by the this data set to work you all the column strings. Okay, and then then you you can get so I where which column is ring? Okay, the position is the seventh. Okay, and then you can pop it, and then uh, the after you pop it, it will no longer be there. Okay. Uh, after pop it, it will no longer be ring. Okay, but rings is taken off. Okay, because it popped to this column J. Okay, and then you can insert this column J back. Okay, insert this column J back. Okay, to the end of it because so this is a position. All the other columns after all the other columns. Okay, and then you can see it again. You can see that okay, the so rings is now to the end of the column. Okay. okay. Yeah, these are just uh, pandas. Okay, and the. Pandas actually tracks your uh, tracks your index. So what we want to do is actually we don't really want them to training uh, data. Probably this is too big. I cannot see the all, all the cells. Yeah, I have to run this. Okay. So if we run this, essentially this is saying I want to get. 70% of the data. This is the beginning, this is the whole data this size, but 70% as a training data. And uh, the next 30% of the testing. Okay. So what we do is essentially this will be the training and this will be the testing. Testing start from this position all the way to the end. And we will get this size. I'm sorry, excuse me. Yeah. Uh yeah, uh, I haven't removed the column yet. Yeah, bec yeah, it's still it's still there. Yeah, if you look at the, let's say the trend, it it's still there. Did you, when you pop it, did you do something? Because I was looking at that too. Was like normally I would drop it, right? So yeah. Oh, it, it's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right here. Yeah. Okay. So this is the last column dropped. Okay, this is exclusive, right? Yeah, and this is the last column. Okay, so this will be a range, which does not include the last column. Okay? okay, this will be the last column. Okay, right. So this is the one dimension column vector. This will be. Yeah, we we, we can actually print it. Uh, let's say you can see extrain. Ring is not there. Okay, if you look at white trend. Okay. Yeah, it's so it's rings. Okay. And when we prepare uh, them, and then we set the reservoirs, proper numbers. This means we need a ten percent increase to the to the majority. Of, okay, and then uh, the tree will not go beyond the best ten. Otherwise, it will make overfit. Okay, so then then once we have the model, we can fit it. Um, this is the training data. This is the label, right? And after the trial, we test it. Okay, and see what will be the predicted value and the true value. Okay. Yeah. So you can see the the. So it's a pretty value, 11.4, this is 13, a little bit far away, but you can fine tune the data.
parameters. They, right? they want to trace if they get much more accurate. Okay, and uh, you can see that, yeah, so the numbers do are close, but there's some distance there. This is kind of error, and you can count the error as mean, mean square error, okay. And you can see every value kind of on average is like a two away from the true value, okay. So this is what you can do. So, yeah, so far we have not tuned those parameters. Yeah, you can, you can actually tune those parameters, okay. And uh, I will show how you tune the parameters using support vector machine, because I don't want to show the same piece of, uh, I want to show more models that you are aware of them, okay. Okay. Let me see. So, yeah, so let me clean it. Okay, so last time there is some historical result. Okay, this is actually a piece of code, uh, data that uh, if you load it, you will see. So this is essentially, uh, there are some features, and this is a comp. So it's uh, like bike, bike rental data. Okay, in what kind of weather, whether it's weekday or weekend, okay, how many bikes is rental on that day? Right, so it's a kind of feature. So in Birmingham City, we also have bike rental. Right? So it's kind of similar service, okay. And uh, I forget where is this data, which city is it? I've, yeah, anyway, it's kind of similar to like in Birmingham. Okay, you want to predict what is a, likely to be the bike rental number. Okay. <coughs> so what you do is, this is like shuffling the data so that it's no longer the original order. Because sometimes the, the data is ordered by zero labels and one labels and two labels. You don't want that. <coughs> and then this is what we did before, 70% for training. Okay, and we will drop the color index so that it, it becomes a new data set. It's like a deep copy instead of the original uh, pointing back to the original columns. Okay, and uh, and we can also do the testing data. And finally, we will get those metrics. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, training data with 500 rows, and there are five features for each row. Okay, testing the uh, uh, training data is labeled with just the the back numbers. Okay, the column of back numbers. Okay. It's kind of like this. It's the testing data, 220 rows. Okay. And then we can try a support vector machine. So to try support vector machine, we are doing support vector regression. So this is R. If you are doing classification, it's C. Okay. And uh, so what you do is you can say, I want to try a linear kernel. Okay. I want to C equal to 1. So if, uh, these are the support vector uh, machine parameters. Okay. So this is like, a, uh, this is like a, the penalty for slack variables, how, how far you are from the the, the lines as an error. Okay, so uh, so how many of you are familiar with support vector machine? Then I, I think uh, I, there's no point to explain those hyperparameters. You just tune them and uh, to see the best result. Okay, so yeah. So what you do is you, you can see that some are the predict values, some are the actual values, some have big errors. Okay, so. You can you can also count what's the average error. It's close to two thousand, which is not very good. Okay, so uh, we want to bring this number down. Okay, so what you can do is to do go so simply as a grid search. So grid search it also is like a, then you have model selection grid search. CV means cross validation. Okay, by default it will use three for the cross validation. We'll cut the data for you and uh, all, for all three pieces it will try and report the average. Okay, so so essentially you all you need to do is just like before. You define this model, okay? And you define the range of values you want to try, and these are the parameters C and A before, right? And this is like a dictionary. Values is a range, and these are the ranges you want to try, okay? And then you uh, you create using the grid search library, you create what is the model, right? And what are the parameters we want to try? This is dictionary already specified, and uh, then you call it fit. It will try all those combinations for you. And finally, give you the best model. Okay, so this is a really convenient, but it will take a while, I think. Let me see. Yeah, I have to run it. Okay. Yeah. So that's three for the cross validation. So although there are eighty-one uh, that repeats three times, it will be many instances. Okay. And uh, you can see that after that, you will choose the best model. Okay. And uh, if you t you get this best model. Right, so and uh, this is the best model you take it and uh, predicts error. Okay, it will be much lower. Okay. Previous is uh, 1800, now it's 1700. Okay, and you can use the more advanced uh, stuff like previously we used linear kernel. 
you can use the RBF kernel, okay, and you can use Google Search to choose the parameters. It can get even lower, but this will run a bit longer, okay. So, uh, yeah, we will wait for a while, and uh, uh, let's just uh, run the next cell, okay. And uh, because uh, there are so many, comp let me see. Guy, just uh, hide it. Anyway, it, it's running. I, I don't know why the, 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 the training progress is missing, but previously it was shown there, right? So, uh, <laughs> anyway, so maybe I hit some button. I, I don't know how it functions. Hide the, hide it. Maybe double click. So it's training. It is because there are so many models. And uh, this kernel is a bit more expensive, so it will take a while. And uh, once it's done, it will return you this error, and it will be much lower. Okay, uh, we will not wait for now. We will probably continue. Oh, okay, yeah, it's coming out, <laughs> and I don't know why. So I think uh, it's keep training. It's still keep going. Okay, so yeah, it's it's still going. Okay. Each one is fast, but we have so many parameters to tune, so it's slow. Okay, each one is actually zero second. But you, you can see we have so many combinations of that because we try the very large ranges for C and epsilon. So, so it will take a while, and uh, yeah, we let it run. We continue with our next one. Okay. <coughs> okay, this is hyperparameter tuning, which I just assumed. Okay, we probably tune the model parameters to get the best result. And uh, so besides this, actually, I want to show some more advanced uh, things that you can do with Python, machine learning others. Okay. Uh, so we talked about an LT and gen film, which essentially is natural language processing. Right? You want to cross on Twitter stuff and see what's the trend. Uh, okay. So this can be done here. So essentially, I, I read this model. It takes 10 minutes. I think there's no point to, to, to do that in the presentation. So essentially, I'm showing you how to do that. So essentially, you will have NLTK. And uh, so you have the, it will provide a tokenizer. You can tokenize a sentence into the words you want. OK? And once you have the words, OK, you can throw it to a model from Jensen called WorkVac. So WorkVac essentially studies your, all the sentence. And there's a slide window over the sentence. What it does is that it look at your surrounding words and want to predict your word. Okay, there's a neural network model to do that. Hopefully, after seeing all the sliding windows many, many times, it will be able to predict the word. Okay, so finally, all these words will become a vector in how many dimensions you specify. Let's say here we we specify each word should finally learn into a 100 dimension vector. Okay, and once these words go into the Euclidean space, then you can see how close they are. Let's say the cosine similarity, or even Euclidean distance. Okay, and you can find similar words. You can do other stuff with that. You can throw it to, let's say, recursive neural network. It's a deep learning model. Um, it will be better than using one-hot encoding of the word, which means you have a dictionary. It's, you have this word, this is one, the other zero. This you don't have the correlation between words. Using what to vac, you will get those vectors that have some correlation between them. Okay, so let's see a demo here. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, it should probably be done. Okay, yeah, it's done. Okay, if it starts running, it will be done. Okay. Uh, by the way, so there are some minor details here. You can see that uh, we we can actually run the job in parallel. Here we just say we run in one one call. Okay, you can actually run on if like this machine can run on eight calls. You just specify. I want eight calls to run the job. It will eight times faster, hopefully. Okay. And most of the five or six times faster because there's some overhead there. Okay, and uh, yeah, so yeah, and then you can see the error drops a little bit. Okay, previous is seventeen hundred using up if kernel is fifteen hundred, and you do want to tune all those parameters. Let's kernel and see whether you can further make it down. Okay, so this is hyperparameter tuning, okay. and uh, the next one is the word to vac, and as I mentioned, so. Uh, so what we, what to vac essentially what we do is we use uh, NLTK to tokenize the, 
the, the words. Okay, once we have the each sentence a, a bunch of words. Okay, then we just throw into what vac. Okay, it will learn the vector for you. Okay, and this will take for ten minutes. Okay, so I don't want to show. Okay, and finally you can save the model to the disk, and then we will load the model and see how it works. Okay, so this project is actually uh, I think uh, with well, Informatics Institute in UAB, which they focus on. Uh, Bioinformatics. Okay, so what they are interested in is actually there's a library for bioinformatic uh, publications called PubMed. Okay, so they crawl all those uh, document IDs and the title of the document, and then the abstract of the document, which could be pretty long. Okay, so what they have right now is that they have those. Uh, so this abstract about which gene and the other gene, whether they like uh, activate each other or they are inhibiting each other. So what they want is extract those genes into nodes, and if they say this gene activates the other, there's a plus edge between them, okay? If this inhibits the other, there's a minus edge between them, okay? So this is what they want to do. They already have the gene library that you, you can easily get the name from the sentence, but you want to know the other, like uh, verbs, or which one is positive, which one negative, right? So, yeah, so how to learn this? What to back actually can do this job, okay? Let's take a look at so so essentially what we back we already trained ten minutes uh, goes through all the windows and well let's use this model to produce the volume in the middle okay so we already did that of course there are a lot of hyperparameters you can tune window size all those things okay to get the best result and uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so so it's not looking at the whole article. It's uh, yeah. actually document ID, title, and abstract. Yeah. So this is a tab separated. It's not CSV. So it's table. We will see that shortly in during notebook. It will be much clearer. Okay. And does it take into account like scope words? What take a what? Does it take into account scope words? Like stop words. Oh, you can remove stop words in in your TK. It's a natural language processing library. Right? You can you can just call the library do whatever you want. Okay, yeah, so it's very convenient. They have the stop word list. Uh, just uh, let me see whether I already have it. Okay. So you're combining that? So you're using the NLTK to do tokenization and then yeah. you're applying the words to back to do the yeah. distancing? Yeah, JSON is for work back, NLTK is for parallel okay. yeah. So you can see this is sentence tokenizer is actually from NLTK. Okay. And uh, you can actually get, let's say, I want to remove all those uh, like uh, punctuations, so notations, right? All those stop words, they are all, you can just load them and then see whether they are in there. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So the JSON is for the, for the, <coughs> for the, for the right, which is for like the distancing and the topic? Is that what that's? Uh, topic modeling, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, what vac is a uh, specific thing that they're using. It's they actually wrap Google's what you like model. So it's running C, okay. But they, they actually open a Python API there, so it's very easy to use. Okay. So, yeah. Now we are loading this model, and let's see how it works. Yeah, so let, let me clear any outputs that is potentially there. Okay, so this is a model file, and I'm just loading it. Okay, after loading it, we can, uh, we know that, so I asked the, the guy who want to collaborate, so what are the terms that may be related? Activate the activator, stimulator, right? So increase or the inhibit those verbs, right? And then I, I want to see what other potential ver words will be there, right? If the embedding is good enough, those words will be very close to each other, okay? So you just find the most similar ones. Okay. And here are the inhibiting, activating, suppressing, blocking, right, stimulating, uh, like a bind, uh, inducer. I think most of them are quite related. Uh, modulator, suppressed, right, right, inactivate. Okay, so even so, this list I go go all the way to. Uh, we, we return the two hundred mo most uh, popular ones. Okay, most the similar ones. This is two hundred. Okay, and you can see that. All the way here, you still have something very uh, similar, like decrease, right, and depletion, co-activator, okay, blocker. All these are like uh, whether it's uh, like a 
reinforce each other or like uh, inhibit each other, right? those kind of terms. Okay, and then you, in the terms, you can further extract them and explore and uh, expand your. What is your that list of words that you gave? It are these distances from those words or? Oh yeah, so 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 essentially, let me see whether I can find. So if you look at this model dot walk back, it's actually. It's a word of actors, okay, word of actors. Okay. If you, let's say we want to look at a particular, the first word, let me see how, how to get this. Yeah, so, so I kind of forget the, the library to call it. Uh, so you can, it's essentially the vectors of all the terms okay. you have, yeah. Uh, yeah, then you, you have the coordinates, right, in 100 dimensional space. Right. Okay. You come to like cosine similarity, the, that's what they are doing. But, but they have a function for doing that. You can also do that yourself. Sure. Int not iteratable. Yeah, you, you maybe you need a word instead of int. For example, let's let's look at this mitigating. Okay. It should retain your vector here. Okay. Yeah, that's the vector representation for them. Okay. And then you have those vectors, you can find a similar word. Okay. okay. Yeah, so for example, there's a gene stuff that are very, uh, so you want to find the top 50 potentially similar things. You can see there are a lot of potential gene names that could be very similar to this gene, for example. Okay, and you can actually, like say, crawl Twitter news and then use this, see whatever you're interested, keywords, right, then see what's happening there, and explore a little bit. And actually, you can explore back to the, the document. Let's say I want to see what this, what is this talking about? Right. I can go back to this document and uh, just to find it. Oh, it's here. Then oh, I see what's happening there. Right. So it's, it's kind of interactive. In some sense. Okay. Yeah. So this is a natural language processing. Okay. And there are a lot of things you can do, but this is just uh, showing you what to back. Uh, Essentially, this is most likely a pre-processing step to uh, your like a deep learning model, for example. But you can use it already for other ta tasks. Okay. And uh, lastly, we want to really look at deep learning. Okay, deep learning is really a special kind of machine learning model, and like uh, like transaction data, uh, where you have those different features. Uh, that so value range can be very different, right? So in deep learning, you usually look at those homogeneous features. Okay, like you know, for image, you look at pixels. Okay. And for sentence, right, natural language or speech, you look at those the same signal or the same words. Okay, they are homogeneous, and you are using neural networks to extract those features that may be helpful to you. Okay, so so it really became popular because uh, I think uh, if you from Stanford, professor there, uh, essentially uh, build a data set where there are so many categories of objects there that can be recognized, and there are so many images for the training. So these are human labeled categories. Okay, you, you can imagine how many manpower you need. Okay. So uh, with this kind of big data set, you can tune um, a model with numerous parameters. Okay. And the computation power is now compensated by GPU, so you can really run it in like 10 years ago. Okay. And so there's a particular kind of neural network structure called a convolution neural network. Uh, I won't get into the details. Essentially, CAN is the convolution layer essentially extracts features from the image. Okay, so these are the image extraction from a uh, feature extraction from the image data. And once you extract it, uh, this is a deep model, right? So after that, you get the last uh, features you extracted from the image, and you go to the traditional neural net models, uh, just like SVMs or stuff. Okay, so the traditional neural net model. Okay, and uh, so this will finally. So this is the predictor one thousand the objects image. Okay. Uh, so each image you have a let's say this is a cat, this is a dog, there are a thousand of them. Okay, this is a plane or something. Okay, and then you go through three layer traditional neural network finally. Okay, and uh, there will be lots. Let's say I predict one thousand each one has a score. Right, actually it's a cat, but I predict dog that has a high score. That will be lost, and it will do that population that the training process. Is. Okay, so essentially the training process will be your image go all the way up, and then you see what's a loss. And then you do great descent all the way tuned down back there. Okay. But you don't want to do that for for your own data set. Because 
you don't have so many data to choose so many parameters there along the way. Okay, and you you probably also this is time consuming. They may spend uh, ten thousand when the uh, US dollars to choose a preview of the model by right, on such an extensive data set. So if you think of those features they're down there, let's say uh, those they may learn features about air, eye, right, leaf, all those basic features, right? They could be helpful to your application, right? Why not just uh, use their features and rebuild your model a little bit? So this is called transfer learning, okay? So essentially those features, these models are already built, okay? So all that I need to do is, okay, I get those features there. You get your image, you know all the way you want to those features. Now I just have trained this network there, okay? This is what you can do. So uh, after training this network, it will be much, much faster. And uh, you don't need a big data because the feature already is for you and they're good enough to describe the image data. Okay, so this is called transfer learning. So I did uh, the, this for essentially, let's see. Yeah, so this is transfer learning. And uh, we don't have time for that because this is also time consuming. Okay, it would take a, uh, a while, okay. So maybe 20 minutes to make it done. Okay, so uh, I will just go through what we did here. So essentially we will, so this is your TensorFlow. TensorFlow embedded the Keras API, which Keras API is a more general deep learning API, but because it supports down there, it can run TensorFlow, it can run other, other software. But TensorFlow essentially embedded into the package. So you can direct call TensorFlow, Keras, okay. And you have some preview the, like a CNNs, convolution apps, okay, you can load it, okay. And after load it, what you need to do is now for your training data, you put it there and you extract the features, okay. But once you extract the features, you 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 will see these features that there are so many images, okay. These are the features you get, okay. And uh, for those features, you, you build another neural network on top, okay. And then you you can train it, uh, you can train it what what have this. Layers one by one, okay, and you train it, okay. And uh, so, yeah, finally, you save the model to your disk, for example, right? Because it may take 20 minutes. Okay. Now, let's see how the model will work, okay. Oh, sorry, I think. Uh, yes. Okay, so here we can see the software versions, essentially uh, Python version, TensorFlow version, Keras version. Okay, Keras is built in TensorFlow. Though. Okay, and then we load the data set. So the data set is uh, from uh, uh, Kaggle. Kaggle is a competition website for data science. So people uh, give some money and then different people compete with each other. The winners will get the money. Or it's kind of, uh, you know, will get the honor of Okay. So they have released a data set about dog breed, okay. essentially different kind of dogs. Okay. And this is not the label that appear in ImageNet. ImageNet may just say dog or cat, because there are so many objects you need to cover. Okay. But those extra features will help you to, obviously help you to recognize what kind of dog it is. Right? You can imagine those image features kind of are shared by those applications. Unless you are working on very uh, unique data like a medical image. Right? So this is kind of never seen before in the training data, then it's a different thing. Okay, and so, yeah. Let me clean this first. It seems like some remaining. Okay, so we can first load the labels. These are the labels. So this is the image ID. This is uh, the kind of dog it is. Okay, and uh, so if you count the breed, we, we have seen that before, right? So value counts. Okay, so you can see these are the different types of dogs, how many images there are in training data. Okay, so this is. How it looks like, and uh, so so this is a, a sample submission file. So essentially, it says for each image, you say which which kind of dog, what's the probability you got. Okay, so this is helpful that we, we can extract these these dog types. Okay, so we can run this. Essentially, you will see the number of training images, how many, and these are all the dog types. Okay, there are. 120 of them, okay? 
and uh, these are the number classes. Okay. I think this should be good. Now we can. Uh, this is essentially some basic stuff to read a, uh, write a how to read an image and uh, convert it into pixels in your memory. Okay, so we are not going into detail of that. Okay, and then what we we need to load two models. The first model is our saved model. Okay. The second model is you know the ResNet 50 model because you know for a test image you first need to go through ResNet 50 to get those features and then go to our model, right? And then you get the, the, the classification result. Okay, so here's what we do. So if you get image from this JP, JPEG file, so this JPEG file is actually uh, yeah it's some, somewhere here, but uh, I think we, we can look at here. Okay. Yeah, this is a Husky image I downloaded from the web. Okay, so so you can you can get it. So essentially, you load it and then you show it. It's in memory now. Okay, right. And then the next thing is essentially you run ResNet predict, get those features, and then use these feature input, run your model, and then get the output, and then you extract those top five most likely dog names. Okay, I pr probably for, let me see what's there. No, that's not, not defined. I probably didn't run this. We need to load the model. It will take a while. Okay, those model, especially with ResNet, is big. Okay, it will take a while. But we will soon see the result. Yeah, it's loaded. Okay. So I think we can run this now. Yeah, so Husky is the third one. So uh, some other. Uh, Dogs that predict. I think it's very close to to our image. Uh, we have no internet. Can can we connect to internet? Yes. So, yeah. Um. There's like a there's a guest internet. You should be able to see it. Okay, this one. Yeah. Okay. What's the password? Uh, crap. <laughs> I think it's like um, is it capital Q C O B E S capital A L L E N. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cobbs with a C and capitalized. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, can, can you have time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Shift C O B B S That might be it. I don't okay, know if that's thanks. it. It might I think we are very uh, almost the end, so we will end very shortly. Okay, so So you can see those are all Visually similar. Yeah, they are all visually similar. If you look at, uh, let's see whether we can get them Google. Okay. We probably need to go to Google Image. Yeah, just type in images that Google. Oh, okay. Image, I think, is it? It's a bit slow, though. Yeah. Uh, image? Okay. Yeah, just images. Yeah, then Emoji Dog. Yeah, it's kind of similar to our image if you look at. So it, it's it's understandable why it it's not ranking that dog to you know this is very similar to this. Right? So you can understand why it misclassified. But if you see Husky is still there, and we can try some random dog there. Okay, so let, let, let's just search for dog image and see which one you want to try. Which one you want to try? This one? No. no. This one? Yeah. Oh, okay, let's let's do that. Okay. Uh, let's <laughs> save image as. Uh, let's first. Oh, balls, woman to death. <laughs> okay. Good job. <laughs> okay, let's pull it here, and this is called a download .jpg. Let, let's try this. This is a tough dog. <laughs> okay, let's let's go here, and uh, because we already load the model, you just uh, change it with this file. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's let's see how it will work. Okay. All right. So let, let's see whether this dog makes sense. Okay. All right. That's not a weird dog. That's it's like Not not really. I think. Right. Let's try the second one. I, I see Boxster, so... No, it's not a, it's not a Boxster. 
Is it? Yeah, I think uh, at least uh, within top five, you will predict some uh, that, that's very close. So this is already impressive because we have 120 classes. And uh, yeah, if you look at the first right, one. Now we've got to look at that last one. Just okay. To see what that is. Okay. So they are all like uh, this brown color, right? So, or golden color. So, yeah, so you can see at least they wow. learn something. <laughs> okay. Actually, we can try this log again and see what they, they can recognize. Save image as. Let's just uh, rename the file so that it's not so long. Brown dog. <laughs> That's just uh, okay. This is dog. So, but but it's not just a uh, deep learning has a lot of applications. This is just a fun stuff. But, uh, you know, yeah. This is as you know, if you have image data you want to analyze, it can help you analyze. Uh, okay. Let's see whether it's accurate. Okay. I think we have the. Yeah. So w what it does is that it can help you do image search, right? So essentially, if you don't know which dog you want, right? So you just see the dog. I don't know which breed it is. I, I go here and I explore top five. But that's it. And I go back to Google Image. I can search a bunch of them, right? So this is very useful. Okay. And uh, uh, this can also be useful. Let's say. If you want to, uh, like in UAB, we have the like a uh, 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 you know cyber crime research group, and is it what they want to do is, for example, they get all those Twitter profile and see whether they can be terrorists, right? So with a gun or on the track or something, right? So so you you can get label them, okay? And then say this is a terrorist, that's not the right terrorist, and then retrain them, and you will get a class file for whether it's a terrorist or not. Okay, what's the probability? Okay, so so there are a lot of applications for that. Okay, if you can also you can use pictures and see what, what could be useful, and as long as you can label them, that would be. Useful. So you can do that with like, can you do it with like audio and stuff too? Like yeah, so yeah. So song, you, you so, so deep learning is essentially for video, audio, image, and uh, natural language. Okay, so yeah, but but not traditional transactional data. Transactional don't have the deep structure there. Maybe just statistical. Already enough. Okay, so so deep learning really for intuitive things. If you human can predict, but you don't know how to write a piece of code to do that, go back, uh, go to deep learning. Okay, that that's what. In the middle of the training and all that, thinking that you also uh, yeah. try to address um, bias. What, what, so, so yeah. how do you address bias when you're training? The, the oh, so so you, you mean the image bias, right? So yes, so what, what you can do is you, you if for the large classes you can sample some, and for the small class you can replicate those images. This is possible. So just like a traditional machine learning, we whatever we do, and we can adjust the weights, right? So you can say this image is like a ten that image if my image is rare, for example. So so it's this is kind of similar to machine learning stuff, like traditional machine learning. And uh, there are other ways. Let's say you can crop. Let's say you can crop the image. Right, this dog is crop this is to that dog. Right, so if you you, you make it fatter, okay, you change the image a little bit, flip it, and it's still the image. Right, so you can use this technique. Cool. Does it take like, um, yeah. like for example, like like in, with humans, like at a young age, you might yeah. be able to base on certain facial features, like yeah. diagnose diseases, yeah, like infant diseases or stuff like that. You could do that. Yeah, I think so. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I think a recognition, um, medical imaging. Just, just from the image. Like yeah, yeah. Image, yeah. yeah, I, I think uh, like a face, face recognition, mm -hmm. uh, deep learning has been applied and it has been very successful. Also like medical imaging. Uh, there's even a paper that recently some guy pointed me to this. So they are using, uh, you know, deep learning. LSTM is a kind of deep learning module I, to do like a high frequency stock market classification, okay, we buy sell. So these things can do a lot of things, not not just uh, finding the dog you want. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, that already, yeah. Like yeah. A, I mean, you could uh, to some degree replace replace a radiologist to some you, degree. Maybe, <laughs> but but I, I think uh, <laughs> work faster. You know? Yeah, it's a uh, it's like a filter of things for you, yeah. and then you still need a like a doctor to look at all the things. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's definitely you cannot totally rely on. Okay, no, but learning is more like a recommendation. Uh, I know that people are talking about the autonomous driving, but you know, these days there's uh, some 
problem. So you, you always need a domain expert to see the data and whether that makes sense. It's a tool to help domain expert to drop off those noise irrelevant data, but you still better have somebody know, know it and see whether it makes sense. Because you can technically like walk into, you can like right now you go to CES and they have the machine, you put your cuff in and it checks your blood pressure and your heart rate and stuff, but you could at some point like sit down, because there are visual cues that doctors take all day long before they even put a machine on you. Yeah. You walk in and they're looking at you and they know that, okay, well, I need to check for this, this, or this, just by I see. At you. I see, yeah. So you I like see. walk into like a queue. Yeah. Get like an initial diagnosis. Yeah, you can do a. You can do an app, right? Yeah. Take a take a yeah. picture of yourself and see what what do you. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, there could be already apps for that. Uh, I, I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> the data planning have been well, uh, like a one one decade already, and uh, yeah, so it's it's really something that you might want to look into. <laughs> no. it's, uh, it's a cool idea. I but with transfer learning, you can do whatever you want, yeah. right? So These features are. Sure, this person, along with their driving record yes. and their, their credit card purchases. Yeah. And uh, then how much well. they yeah. let yeah. All of a sudden, they enter another risk pool. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, okay. Uninsurable. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for for. Uh, like listen to like it's almost two hours. Uh, no. yeah. yeah, so uh, this is my contact information. If you have anything that you want to ask or you you think that could be project you interesting that we can collaborate, you can also contact me okay, through the email. Maybe thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Have a good night. Just a couple things before we take off. Uh, um, food. There's no way I can possibly eat that myself. Um, I, I turn my computer off. Um, I wonder, um, for the people who are here a little bit late, I want to reiterate um, Robert Half. Um, uh, Robert Half, uh, they're a uh, technical recruiter, data analytics, stuff like what we do. Um, he left his business card, if you want to grab that. He left a pile of uh, um, um, salary surveys. So you can flip through, I'll find your job title.